So, hello everyone. Uh, let's get started. <clears throat> Today we are going to summarize a little bit what we have seen in the previous lectures and uh, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, other topics that we are looking at in databases and that you can learn more about in some of the follow-up courses. So since the last summary, uh, one of the first things that we have seen there was uh, how we can um, how we can design a database. And one tool that people typically use in order to design a database are those entity relationship diagrams, such as the one that you see here, where we represent the entities that should be um, stored in the database together with their properties and together with the relationships and subclassing relationships and so on between those different entities. And then we have seen how we can take one of those entity relationship diagrams and uh, translate them into SQL. I also pointed out a couple of tools which uh, at least partially automate that step. We have then seen how we can take an initial draft for a database and uh, refine it by first of all detecting dependencies uh, within your data in particular if the value in certain columns depends on the value in other columns. Here for instance we have um, a table with information about TAs, about the hours they work and about their salary and the salary is essentially a function of the number of hours worked. This is why we have a function dependency uh, that links the hours column to the salary column. And that means that here we are storing data uh, redundantly and uh, that causes all kinds of problems. So we have seen how we can get rid of that redundancy by uh, decomposing tables. And in this example here, we probably rather want to represent a table like this divided into two tables where one keeps track of dependencies between the TA name and the number of hours they work in. The other table keeps track of dependencies between the number of hours and the associated salary. And we have seen a couple of algorithms that bring an initial database schema into normal forms, which make certain guarantees about which dependencies you may still have in the data. After that, we have started discussing about a distributed a database assistance, which is often necessary because either you want to store more data than you can fit on a single machine, or you just want to serve a lot of customers uh, potentially globally. And in those cases, you probably want a distributed database system. And uh, there's a couple of challenges that uh, come with that. In particular, what happens if you have multiple copies of the data on different machines that you somehow need to keep in sync. And uh, we have seen the CAP theorem, which uh, based on some simplifying assumptions, um, essentially shows uh, a trade-off between multiple things that we want in this uh, context. Uh, first of all, we want to keep our system available, meaning that we can continue to serve our customers, for instance, if we are an online shop. We also want to keep our data between multiple copies uh, consistent. And of course, we want to be ready to handle situations in which the connection between different components in your system is uh, disturbed. And we can classify systems a little bit according to which trade-offs they make in this uh, context. We have seen traditional database management systems which uh, favor consistency above everything else. And have you seen so-called new SQL systems which uh, might uh, give up consistency at least temporarily in order to increase availability and we have seen a couple of corresponding systems there. The, the guidelines that those systems follow has been abbreviated by the acronym BASE which stands for basically available soft state eventually consistent so in particular, last part here, eventually consistent, already uh, hints at uh, some of the main ideas, um, which is in particular that uh, we have potentially multiple copies uh, of the data out of sync, but not for eternity, but very quickly, the updates to one of those replicas will propagate 
uh, to the other ones. And we have seen a couple of corresponding systems there as well. And as you see, base that is chosen particularly to contrast it from ACID, which is those traditional guarantees that we have seen that database systems make when processing transactions. Um, here we have atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So here we favor um, consistency uh, in particular above uh, everything else. So after that, we have seen a new SQL systems uh, new SQL systems essentially get back the asset guarantees and in some cases even stronger guarantees by exploiting a couple of uh, new ideas, for instance, a new hardware. We've in particular seen the Google Spanner system and uh, HStore in this uh, context. So now we had an overview of different distributed database systems that make a different uh, trade-offs in terms of, in particular, um, which consistency guarantees they make and uh, under which circumstances they remain available. After that, we have started discussing about different data types. For most of the course, we have been looking at relational data, um, at uh, data tables, basically. Um, here, we have been looking at uh, three other data formats that have motivated specialized systems for processing. But in particular, we have been looking at a graph database systems, which process data that can be conveniently represented in the form of a graph. And um, there's various representatives here you see. Some of them we have in particular discussed about the Neo4j system and uh, about the corresponding uh, query language, which is somewhat uh, close to uh, SQL in certain aspects. We've also discussed about uh, data streams and uh, data streams um, are uh, essentially um, cases where the data is not static, but it keeps getting generated. If you think, for instance, about a stock ticker, traditionally people would deal with uh, changing data as you see here. Every once in a while we would load data uh, from the data source into our database, into our data warehouse, uh, where we can analyze it. But um, here, this loading process only takes place every once in a while. So it is pretty bad if you want to react to events essentially in real time. And that has motivated um, a different kind of system which focus on processing data streams. You have seen multiple representatives. Uh, the most recent one that we have discussed about and that I have quickly demoed, that is a KSQL DB which internally is based on uh, Apache Kafka. And uh, we have seen how this system um, distributes a stream processing um, at a large scale and uh, how, it, um, how it essentially translates your uh, SQL-like queries into low-level operations in those Apache uh, clusters. Finally, we have been discussing about spatial data, like for instance, for representing two-dimensional maps, but you can also have it in uh, more dimensions uh, than that. Um, we have seen that in particular, traditional indexing structures are not uh, very well suited to uh, represent um, that kind of data and to index it efficiently. So we have seen techniques such as set ordering, where we essentially try to map a multi-dimensional space onto a one-dimensional uh, numbers. And uh, as you see here, um, we have mostly assigned a close by coordinates to a close by uh, numbers here by mixing the, um, the uh, bits of the binary representation of the different coordinates. And after we have done this, we can perhaps even use uh, traditional indexing structures in order to index objects within that uh, space. Also, we have seen uh, arc trees, which are essentially an adaption of uh, big trees to a spatial data where we associate nodes not with uh, key ranges, but rather with multidimensional uh, bounding uh, boxes. And uh, finally, I have demonstrated one a system for processing spatial data, which is the BigQuery GeoVis uh, system. And also here, you see that it supports a language which is an extension of a SQL. So many of those systems, they support some variant of SQL, which makes it easy 
to uh, get into it if you already used to SQL. In the last lecture, we have uh, talked about approximate processing, and uh, that generally helps if you have a lot of data that is too large to be processed in its um, entirety. And uh, in those cases, maybe you want to process some subset of the data in order to get at least um, approximate query result. And we have seen multiple ways of doing that. Here you see, for instance, the interface used for uh, online aggregation. And um, this is a process by which the system continuously refines the approximation waits for the user to stop it, basically. Um, but there's other systems that allow users to specify error bounds or time bounds in advance, and then they try to get the best possible result under those uh, constraints. So this was a short overview of the material that we have seen in the last a couple of uh, lectures since I gave the last um, overview. Um, if there's any uh, last uh, lingering questions on that course material, I would be happy to take them now. Did anyone have an urgent question about any of those things or not necessarily urgent or just some question out of curiosity? All right. Um, in that case, um, that concludes basically the uh, course material that we have been uh, discussing here. So in the following, I'm going to say a few words about uh, some of the uh, topics that are currently uh, being researched in uh, database systems. Um, all right. Good. So. Um, some of the topics that uh, currently are being researched in database systems and that we will, for instance, discuss in the upcoming CS6320 course uh, next semester as uh, database management systems on emerging hardware. Because um, a database system always operates on a specific hardware platform. And if the hardware platform changes, then at some point you probably also want to change the database system in order to make data processing as efficient as possible. And there is currently uh, a lot of uh, changes happening uh, with hardware. Uh, for instance, the number of uh, cores uh, keeps uh, increasing, main memory sizes keep increasing. There is uh, new types of hardware, for instance, main memory, which is uh, up to a certain extent persistent or network connections that are extremely fast and uh, often those uh, innovations they change the way we want to do data processing for instance if you have uh, lots of cores hundreds of cores then you probably want to do joint processing in a very different way compared to what we have seen today or um, if you have main memory that is a persistent up to a certain degree then that changes a lot the way in which you want to do logging and a recovery. And also if you have very fast networks now, you might want to change the way in which a distributed database systems are designed. So in each case, hardware has a significant impact on how we want to design our database systems. Now, Another research topics are new uh, types uh, of data because often those new data types, they motivate specialized systems. And we have already seen that in the course, we have discussed about uh, graph data, stream data, and uh, spatial data. And we have seen that uh, those data types motivate specific systems when it comes, for instance, to the indexing structures or to other system design properties. And uh, nowadays, there have been other data types that we didn't have the time to discuss in this introductory course anymore. For instance, database systems that are specialized to handle data, which is associated with probabilities. So it uh, is somewhat more realistic data in the sense that often in practice, you can maybe be 99% sure, but you can often not be 100% sure about, um, about what the state of the world is. And those database systems 
they allow you to represent that intrinsically. Or for another example, more recently, people have been proposing specialized systems for handling video data because there's currently a lot of video data being generated and people need a better ways to analyze that. So those systems, they can, for instance, do things like an object a recognition while maintaining an interface, a query interface that is somewhat uh, still not too far from uh, SQL. Even if the data type remains the same and the hardware remains the same, then uh, still we can change our processing algorithms and perhaps even improve them. There's uh, a lot of work in this direction. People come up, keep coming up with uh, new algorithms that make data processing more efficient. To give you uh, one example about one very popular research topic, um, in this course, we have seen traditional join algorithms that always combine two data sets together. And if you have a query that requires multiple joins, then you have a sequence of those a join operations or a pipeline. Um, nowadays, uh, people found that uh, it is often significantly more efficient if you don't do binary join operations, but rather we do one join operation that joins multiple tables together in one step and uh, can get significantly more efficient than the more traditional vein. Also comes with a couple of guarantees along the lines that um, the overhead for um, processing those join algorithms is uh, somewhat proportional to the maximum result size of the join that you could get. And that is not always guaranteed with traditional join algorithms. And then finally, there's a lot of work that connects the machine learning with databases for the moment. There's uh, various uh, possibilities to apply machine learning in order to make database systems uh, better. That happens at the processing side. It also happens at the interface side. For instance, there's currently a lot of work that tries to use machine learning in order to replace or to uh, complement a query optimizers because a query optimization is very hard. And uh, we have discussed here in this course all the simplifying assumptions that we typically make when doing a query optimization, such as assuming that data is perfectly uniform or that different predicates in a query are not correlated. And often those assumptions turn out to be wrong. So uh, the idea is that perhaps we can leverage machine learning in order to get better at uh, predicting the execution cost of plans or which plan we should select for a given query. And uh, nowadays, there's already some promising results in this direction. Or on the other side, at the interface side, we have now learned the uh, SQL uh, queries, but uh, people are working on uh, methods that essentially translate natural language uh, questions, for instance, into associated SQL uh, queries and uh, use a machine learning in order to uh, do that. There's currently a lot of interest in this direction, and that's also something that we would be uh, discussing in our CS 6320 course, the Advanced uh, Database Systems course, which will be offered in spring semester 2021. We're going to discuss about the topics that I just outlined, also about other recent research topics in databases. Each session uh, discusses one to two papers and there will be uh, presentations to do in the course project. So if that is of interest, do you uh, consider, uh, consider participating? Uh, one final remark. Um, if you haven't already, please consider evaluating this course. Uh, tell us what you like. Tell us what we can improve in future semesters. I believe today is the last day of course evaluations. And uh, now I remain generally available for uh, questions. Um, and uh, if you don't have any questions, also please uh, feel free to already uh, leave earlier. And in that case, I wish you a happy holidays. I think it was an unusual semester, but I think we uh, got through it. And um, I really enjoyed giving this course. I hope you learned something interesting as well. And uh, otherwise, I wish you happy holidays.